but you know uh, he has been you know one of the successful you know, VC that I know in the Austin area. He has been uh, the general partner at Austin Ventures for I don't know seven eight years, and then you know based on the needs of Austin, now Venu is actually uh, trying to start his own uh, VC firm to actually meet the unique needs of. Uh, the Indian community and the Austin community and the, and the Texas community. So I'd like to call upon Wayne to reflect on what's really happening in the in the Texas and the Austin area with respect to entrepreneurship. So that was kind of the, the theme of the event. And then we would like to have uh, Wayne reflect on, you know, on, the, on the landscape, but most importantly, we as a community, what we need to do to actually re-energize the entrepreneurship community because ultimately we'll be the benef uh, beneficiaries of you know, all the work that's being done. So with that, Vedo, please. So it's always a scary thing when Srini calls you his guru. <laughs> that's a hard act to follow. Um, let, me, uh, let me start by saying a lot. Some of you, some of you I know uh, from prior interactions here as well. Uh, the, the first thing, a lot of people today ask me which NIT I was for. I was from. Uh, unfortunately, none of them would take me. <laughs> so uh, I had to go to this other school in another village called Osmania University, uh, which takes anybody actually. But, um, but in any case, so uh, my background is, uh, let me just give you a little bit of my background as context and I'll, I'll talk about entrepreneurship. Uh, engineer by training undergrad in electrical engineering uh, from Osmania University. Uh, I actually came to go to UT here to Austin uh, 23 years ago, uh, so I'm really old. Uh, and I got my master's from UT um, in electrical engineering as well. Then I worked in the industry for four or five years, and a variety of interesting accidents later, I ended up at business school. Uh, I went to Harvard Business School, graduated from there, and then I came to uh, came back to Texas at that time. Uh, first to Houston, where I was with a strategy consulting firm called McKinsey & Company. I was there for three years uh, with McKinsey. And then I, I got recruited to Austin by the Austin Ventures guys uh, in 99. So I came here in fall of 99. At that time, Austin Ventures had $800 million under management, total, total assets that they had ever raised, uh, $800 million. In uh, 10 years, we went from $800 million to $4 billion under management. Uh, so grew almost three and a half times uh, in a, uh, which was the good news. Uh, and as Srini mentioned, the bad news with that is it's hard to put that much money to work uh, while at the same time doing early stage investing. So my passion lies more with early stage companies. Uh, I have personally invested in uh, companies that have become big exits in this town over the last five years. Uh, three of my deals collectively uh, sold for over a billion dollars of total value. Uh, a company called Spatial Wireless in Dallas that I sold for 300 million bucks to Alcatel Lucent. Uh, another one called the Navini Networks, which we sold to Cisco for $300 million, $330 million. And then more recently here, uh, a company called Life Size uh, Communication, which we sold to Logitech uh, for $405 million. So uh, I like doing that kind of stuff, the, the super early stage stuff. So I thought, what, uh, based on what I talked to Srini, uh, put together a few slides to just give you my thoughts on entrepreneurship in Texas. Um, first thing I want to tell you all, the topic is entrepreneurship. I'm not an entrepreneur. So take everything you hear today with a grain of salt because I only know it from the other side of the table. Although in the last year, I'm probably a little more of an entrepreneur because I'm trying to raise my own funds. So it's a little more like being an entrepreneur, but you know, take, take it with a little bit of a grain of salt. Um, what I wanted to cover today, just you know, talk a little bit about the environment today uh, why is entrepreneurship important for the state of Texas? Uh, why should we be doing it in Texas? Uh, what's different today compared to a few years ago? Uh, what are some of the challenges? And there are some real Texas-sized challenges for this market. And then I just want to open it up to anything you, you all want to talk about. Um, so firstly, environment today. Can you, can you read, uh, read that? Can you make it full screen? Say that again? Can you make it full screen? Uh, I make the view. Screen. Go to view. I'll let you do that. Full screen mode. Yeah. There you go. Okay. It's interesting. 
It's dated 2002. But this is very true even today. There's, you know, the venture capital market is shrinking. A uh, lot less money has gone into it in the last few years than before. So even if you come out with the next biggest invention, like a, a wheel that can put the whole world into the industrial revolution, uh, it's hard to find venture capital you know, today. So it's a pretty tough market. Here's another one that's interesting. I call it the tale of two cities. And since it's hard to read, I'll just read it. This guy's got a helmet and his, uh, a shovel in his hand. And he says, raising venture capital is either like banging your head against a wall until cash comes out, or getting buried in it so much money that you have to shovel your way out. Either way, I'm ready. Okay? Uh, so you probably have seen all the announcements of Facebook raising $2 billion and Groupon raising a billion dollars and all that. Uh, the other side of that story is pretty much nobody else is raising any money, right? So it's, it's kind of the guys that don't need it have a lot of access to money. The guys that need it uh, don't have as much access to money. So, so talk for a second about why is this important? Why is entrepreneurship important for the state of Texas? And really, there's kind of two ways to look at it. Uh, first is, if you, in the last five years, and this is actually as of 09, but you can put 2010 in there if you want. In the last five years, almost $6 billion was raised by companies that were venture-backed in this state. So it brings a lot of capital into the state. The second thing is, if you look at where those companies went, you know, Texas has historically been an energy-oriented state, but a lot of it goes into IT, a lot of it goes into uh, business services and life sciences. So it adds to the diversity uh, in this market as well. In addition, it creates really high-paying jobs, and these are enduring jobs as well. Um, so the National Venture Capital Association did a, a study in the last 20 years of how many jobs are created in this market. And, and they don't, you know, so if a company got bought and then shut down the company, they don't take it off. This is total jobs created over the time. Almost a million jobs in the state of Texas were created uh, by venture-backed companies. But what's interesting is, if you look at from a rank in the country of states, Texas was the sixth in terms of the capital invested in that region but it was the third in terms of jobs created and revenues by those companies. So what that tells you is we are very efficient in Texas with our money. For every dollar that we got, we were twice as efficient as the rest of the, the states were in creating jobs with that and in creating uh, you know, revenues and, and a real business around it. The third thing that reason why it's inter interesting is these startups attract big companies to come here to set up their shop here. I mean, you know, Sujata works at LifeSize, for example. Logitech had no <coughs> position in the state, but they acquired LifeSize. Life that becomes the anchor. Now they're like, okay, there's great talent here. What else can I add to it, right? So it becomes an anchor. I mean, most people don't realize that uh, Zynga bought a small gaming company here, for example, and this is now their second largest game development you know, uh, location for them. And the reason they came here was because they bought this one small software company. They realized the talent that's in this market. So here's examples of all these companies that have, you know, moved in this market because they acquired a company that was started by an entrepreneur. And over time, once they move here, they've started to build. And some of these things, IBM, for example, Cisco in particular, I mean, these two guys have literally over thousands of people in the state, all of which happened in the last 10 or 15 years. I don't know how many of you know, but the processor that Apple uses was designed by a company here called Intrinsity, the A4 and the A6 processors, which was their, the source of their so-called differentiation. Uh, it's a company that was based here in Austin that they bought. They never announced it because they, that, that was their secret. Uh, but that's the kind of stuff that is happening in this market as well. So that's why that's important. So now that entrepreneurship is, we understand what it's doing for the state of Texas, the question is if you're an entrepreneur, you know, why should you do the, a startup here, you know, versus in the Bay Area, right? I mean, everybody has startups in the Bay Area. But why Texas? And what I look at is if you look at the five key things you need, do you have centers for research and universities in town? Is there a critical mass of big companies because they have a lot of people that you can hire from, right? That's important. Is there an ecosystem for startups? Is there a historical return uh, results as well, where people have been able to make money, and most importantly, is it a great place that people want to go live in? 
And if you look at any, any one of those things, uh, you know, Texas had to, it ranks really well. So for example, research and universities. What this is, is R&D budgets and the invention disclosures filed every year. And the University of Texas system is listed in there as a separate thing. But I took those four schools and I added them as all Texas universities, even though that's not all Texas, I just added the top four universities. And what you can see is UT is second or third in amount of money it spends on research and the number of invention disclosures it files. And if you take these four universities as a group, across the board, it's second in the country on the amount of R&D spending and the amount of inventions coming out of this place. To give, put that in context, it's two times the size of MIT and three times the size of Stanford's budgets that comes out of this. The historical problem has always been these are state schools, unlike Stanford and MIT. So people did not let them commercialize the technology that was coming out of it. But now, that's starting to change in the state of Texas. If you go to the UT commercialization office today, uh, they will welcome you with an open arm to find any piece of technology and start a company around it. Five years ago, if you knew exactly what you wanted, if you were the inventor of that technology as a PhD student, they would not let you take it out and go start a company with it. It was just that dramatically different. A &M, Texas A&M University, five years ago, A&M had $13 million of licensing revenues where their intellectual property was licensed out and they made $13 million in one year. Last year, they had $300 million of licensing revenues. Now, they have now realized this is big money. They're sitting on a coal line. So, lots of opportunities in this market to go get stuff from these kinds of places. And then if you look at talent and just a startup ecosystem, a lot of people don't realize this, but uh, in terms of technology jobs, Texas is the second largest in the country after California. California, from a tech jobs perspective, is a little over a million jobs in the technology industry. And Texas is slightly over 600,000. So it's about 60% in terms of tech jobs, the size of California. What's different is a lot of marketing, a lot of you know, corporate headquarters tend to be in California. A lot of development centers tend to be here. And that's the big difference for them. We graduate over 1,500 PhDs in science and engineering every year from universities here in Texas. And then most importantly to me, there's a complete ecosystem in place of you know, entrepreneurs, banks that understand them, law firms that understand you know, what entrepreneurs need. Uh, all of those things are in networking organizations. They're all here. And so that has shown up in the results. So these are the companies that have gone public or gotten acquired for material acquisitions, not the $5 million, $10 million acquisitions since 2000. If you add these exits up, that's $25 billion of total value that was created by these startup companies in the last 10 years. If you even take 2000 and 2001 out, because you can say it's, hey, it was still the internet bubble at that time, that's still $18 billion. On average, in this state, you get 2 to $3 billion of value created by startup companies. And we think that's really important because you know, if you go to like North Carolina, for example, Research Triangle Park, everybody says the same thing about RTP. It's like, well, it's the, it's the big market. They have great universities. They have great big companies. The difference is this. We have the experience of actually creating startups that work. We've actually made money. And trust me, nothing works as well as this for an entrepreneur. When they know somebody who used to be in the next cubicle that has gone on to start a company or work at a startup and made his millions, there's no better incentive to drive somebody to go start a company than that. So that's kind of you know the, the values that that's why we think Texas is really well positioned. So what's changed in entrepreneurship? Um, you know, in the last decade it used to be build it and they'll come. You know, you take your time, build a product, the, the people will come. And right now it's much more in the build it, let them come, and then improve it. You know, so there's a lot more emphasis on don't go into your ivory tower, build a big product, and then wait for it to happen. Used to be a lot about eyeballs and traffics and downloads, and you can argue it's still about that, but it's more important to have revenues and path to profitability. As much as I'm not a big fan of Zynga, you know, all these you know, new internet companies and the billion dollar valuations they're getting, the difference between those guys and Pets.com or Webgrocers and all those guys is they have profitability. 
you know, Zynga is incredibly profitable, Groupon is incredibly profitable, Facebook is turning profitable, they have billions in revenues. That's the difference between the last internet dot com bubble versus this. So this is still important, you know, having a path to profitability is still important. It used to be, 10 years ago, amount of money you raised was a badge of honor, or they raised $100 million, web grocers, web that. It's not anymore. It's about how little money can you raise and iterate at a time. A lot of focus was on flipping a company. Sell the company as soon as you can. Make your, you know, take your five million bucks and go away. It's not about that anymore. I mean, you've seen guys like Groupon have turned down six billion dollar acquisition offers from, from Google. People want to build businesses. Facebook doesn't want to go public because they don't want to give up their control. I mean, he had offers to buy his company at a billion, at two billion, at 10 billion. All along the way, he had offers to buy the company. He never sold it. So it's not about flipping anymore. It's about building sustainable companies. <clears throat> and this one is a little more controversial. 10 years ago, the risk of somebody going and doing a startup went away. And what I mean by that is the salaries you took from a startup, they're very comparable to the salaries you get at an established company. They, and in addition, you got equity. So why not take a risk, right? It's now gotten back to again where there is really significant risk in, you know, for both the founders and employees in a startup. Startups cannot continue to pay between 90 to 110 percent of what a big company will pay. That model is broken. It attracts the wrong people to the startups. There are, you won't believe the number of times in my board meetings where we have somebody we really want them to come and join, we like them a lot, but they are stuck on Nortel is offering me 220,000 bucks, you have to match it or I'm not coming. And to me, as soon as I hear that, I basically tell the CEO, let him go. It's not worth going after this guy because he doesn't understand what it means to be in a startup. If he wants his Nortel salary, he should stay at Nortel. You know, and that's another big change that's changing. So the, sum, the way I would summarize it is, from your perspective, assume on capital that less is good. You know, but that has implications for some certain sectors. I mean, there are people here I know who are in the semiconductor industry, for example. You can't do a semiconductor chip for half a million bucks. You just can't, unless you're doing some small analog mixed signal chip. And even there, it's questionable whether you can really do it. <clears throat> so there are going to be some implications for sectors like that that won't be the same going forward as they used to be. Exits, assume that they'll continue to be very constrained exit environment. There are going to be very few overnight successes. Even when Facebook, Groupon, and Zynga get out or get sold or whatever, and yes, there will be a bubble around it. There will be a bunch of companies that will trade up at that time. But fundamentally, that's not going to change what is happening in this industry. There is the haves and the have-nots in this market right now. Those guys are in the haves. And the reason they're in the haves right now is because they are real businesses. Whether we like it or not, they're real businesses. So that's kind of what has changed from the past to the present. So the, let me talk a little bit about the local environment coming back to um, having said all the stuff that we uh, said earlier about what's in the state of Texas, what we strongly believe in is the need of local capital for company formation. It's very hard for a venture investor to come from 3,000 miles away and invest here. I don't care who they are, what story they tell you, I guarantee you Sequoia doesn't go and fund somebody with his first 50,000 bucks in Austin, Texas. You're beating your head against the wall. They're not going to do it. Unless you're a third time entrepreneur and you don't need their money, that's the only time they're going to come here. It's not because they don't want to. It's just hard to scale that business model. And they, would they have a lot of good entrepreneurs in their backyard. So, you know, that's the model that they're used to. Invest close to your location. They need to be able to influence the company, help the company. And it's too little money, too far away for them to do that. So the way the model works is find a local investor. Uh, because in, the, in a state like Texas, for example, where we have great technologists, but we have a lot of first-time entrepreneurs. And when you have a first-time entrepreneur, they need a lot more help than a guy that has been through the process before. And so it takes a long time to go from an idea to putting a deal together. And just not something the West Coast guys know how to put that together, or the East Coast guys for that matter. So we think early stage <coughs> the capital is really, really important.
So with that in mind, let me kind of give you what the issues are in Texas. <clears throat> Unfortunately, the local capital here is really shrinking. So what this is, is if you look at the first half of the decade versus the second half of the decade, how much money was raised per year by funds that were based here in Austin or in, in Texas? And only exception I did was I took out Austin Ventures because we were the, at Austin Ventures, we were the big player in this market. So I took those guys out. And what you see is it's dropped almost 85% between the first half of the decade and the second half of the decade. Even this is a little misleading because the 05, 06 were much better years than 09. In 2009, all the funds based here in Texas raised $19 million total. So that's the big fall, shortfall of capital that's coming in. What that's leading to is what's happening to investments. In the first three years of this decade, 05 to 08, on average every year about a billion three of capital came into the state in venture back companies. In 2009, that number dropped almost half, and it's dropping further. Because there is a gap between when you raise the money. If a fund raises their money in 2000 to 2004, they put it to work in 2003, 2008 time frame, right? So it takes time for the money to get invested. If they didn't raise any money here, what happens in the next decade? They don't put any money to work. So that's a big problem in the state is the capital formation. And it's more of a Texas phenomenon than you would imagine. This is looking at venture capital investment per capita over those five years. I mean, no surprise on California and Massachusetts have historically been number one and number two. What's surprising is how much Texas has fallen behind in the last decade. I mean, it, with all those advantages that we talked about, you know, venture funding is over three and a half times lower in Texas than some of the other, other leading states. It's the second largest state in the country in terms of its overall economy, second largest tech employment base, second largest university R&D and you know, invention disclosure state. And we're sixth or seventh in a lot of capital that's getting formed. So if you look at what happens as a result is, this is one quarter, this is Q3 of 2010, and it's looking at where did the money go, total US venture capital money. Half the money went into California. And Texas was fourth with four and a half percent of the money. So for its economy that's second largest to California, 75% its size, amount of infrastructure we've got, we get one twelfth the amount of capital in this market. And this is, in my mind, the number one big issue that we face in this market for, for our entrepreneurs. So, so with that said, um, let me talk a little bit about a, a few final thoughts. Before I go into, into kind of what this is, what it means is for entrepreneurs, it's important to continue to come up with the new ideas because if, it, if the cycle breaks, it's very hard to rebuild. And as long as there are entrepreneurs with good ideas here, even the local capital is needed, there are ways to get it funded. I mean, the Emerging Technology Fund here locally, I don't know if you have, have people heard about the Emerging Technology Fund, the state of Texas fund? Um, they put $300 million to work in the last five years to start up companies. So there are sources of pockets of money like that that are still around. If it's small enough money, there are three or four new other funds that have come to market over the last five years. They're around. So the first thing I tell you is keep working on the, on the ideas because it's really important. People ask me what I focus on when I look at deals. Um, and there's no magic formula for it, but here are some of the things I would tell you as final thoughts. <clears throat> Number one for me, teams matter. It's a very long and frustrating ride to be a startup company. So pick your teammates wisely. A lot of times what we see is people just meet somebody, you know, they want to start a company, they met somebody else who says, I like your idea. Next thing you know, they're co-founders. I guarantee you I've seen that movie end 50 times so far. And a year from now, they'll be at each other's throats. One guy has invested half his shares. Want to, you know, you want to fire him. He's got all the stake in the company. The other founder is pissed off because of that. So take your time. It's like getting married. You're going to be with this person through the you know, ups and downs of the company, taking time to go build out the right team. 
you know, I like the statement by Eisenhower a lot. Uh, he says, the plan is nothing. Planning is everything. So people will fall in love with the plan. I want to build this company this way. That's how I'm going to do it. And it's not the plan that matters. If I can guarantee you one thing that's going to be always true about any startup you join or start, it is that it's going to change over its time period. It's absolutely going to change. Third thing is stay grounded. People see a company in their market get bought by Google for 400 million bucks. You can see all the dollar coins in their eyes right after that, right? I mean, it's like, oh, mine's going to be the next big thing. You know, if passion drives you, let reason be the reins for that. This is one of my favorite statements. This actually was said to me by uh, Shimon Peres, the uh, Israeli Prime Minister. Uh, we had a group of venture capitalists who went to Israel on a state delegation, and uh, in his speech he used this, which i I written down, I'll never forget. He says, it's really important to be paranoid because as old Air, Air, Air Force pilots will tell you, the one that shoots you down is the one you can't see. If you're flying planes, you know, when you're very comfortable, you've seen all the other planes in combat, there's one behind you that you can't see that's going to shoot you down. And I really like that. And, and you know, most, this is the other thing I, I feel really important. Bernanke said this about the 2008 financial crisis. And they were asking him, why didn't the Fed do this? Why didn't the Fed do that? And he says, appreciate the role of chance and contingency in human events. Everybody thinks that Mark Zuckerberg sat back and somehow came up with exactly what he was going to do for the next 10 years and build Facebook. I wish it was true. It's not. He was smart enough to figure out what needed to be changed and he adapted to it. You're not going to see everything. Sometimes great startups fail because they started at the wrong time. I mean, you might have a great idea right now. The odds that you're going to get raise the funding today are much lower than they used to be 10 years ago, right? But that's what it is. So there are factors that are not in your control. Don't let those really kind of you know take you down either. Just a few things that I thought would be interesting. Now I just wanted to open up to everybody. If you had any questions, either on the stuff we talked about today or anything else, just feel free to. So what is the reason for? Uh funding uh, going down in Texas? Um, two things. Uh, first, from a venture market standpoint, uh, Austin Ventures was a big piece of the success in this market. And because of their fund sizes are now doing increasingly bigger pieces in the larger sized deals. Um, but we drove out a lot of the other investors in the market. Not because we drove them out, we just got all the best deals to ourselves. That list of deals I showed you, the successful deals, over two thirds of those deals were AV deals. So just other guys didn't have as much track record that they could go raise more money with. Um, the second thing that changed was a lot of guys who came to Texas when the markets were going through the roof, when it imploded, they all pulled back to their home markets. Right? So Polaris had an office here, TL Ventures had an office here, a bunch of guys had offices in Texas, they all pulled back to their home markets. And there were a couple of other big funds in this market, like Seven Rosen, Center Point, et cetera, which have had trouble raising new funds because, again, they had historical return issues uh, that prevented them from raising money. So that's a big piece of it. Um, now, there are other reasons for it as well. I mean, if you just look here within 10 miles of this building, uh, there are pension funds that have over $200 billion under management right here in Austin. So if you take any kind of national, normal kind of just, you know allocation from that, there should be four or five billion dollars going into private equity and venture capital. But none of it comes here, and the reason for it is because a lot of them give that money to intermediaries to manage, fund of funds, consultants, etc. And those guys have their best relationships in the valleys, and so you know they have to. They're in the business of raising new funds every year, so they have to raise a California-based fund because that's what helps them raise their next fund. And so they continue to push more money into those kinds of things as well. So those are some of the things. I mean, it's, the pendulum has just swung too far. It'll correct itself. There's no doubt in my mind it'll correct itself. There are a few companies that are coming and setting up shop here, right? Like, some of the big companies. How is, how is that helping? Or is, does that help? With more, like what? Like PayPal, eBay, or uh, there are a few others like uh, Yeah, no, it totally helps. Uh, because what happens is it attracts people to come to Texas. The one thing I can tell you unequivocally, the people that move to this 
market, never leave again. And there's always exceptions, there's one off random, someone who might have just not liked it or whatever and that. But 99% of the people, they move here, they don't leave, yeah, especially I, if they have kids. I was in Bay Area for nine years and moved here five years ago, I'm not going back. Exactly. <laughs> I mean, Google had called me, but I'm not going to go Yeah, back. it's just yeah. a quality of life issue, right? Yeah. I mean, you know, I, I, I'll tell you a story, it's distinctly stuck in my mind, but when I was graduating from business school, um, for the summer, we went to explore whether I should go back to Silicon Valley or not. And at that time, I had a six-month-old son, and you know, my wife was not, a, couldn't care less about startups or anything, she's a speech pathologist. And so we went to California. We would go to dinner after dinner, and there was one topic of conversation at every dinner, all dinner long. How many stock options did you get? You only made your first million, not your tenth. Who cares about you? And it was a treadmill, right? And it's, you know, it, there's an energy in that place that I won't take it away, but it's not for everybody. And there's a stage in life where getting out of it is helpful. And so what these companies do is when they open up here and you can attract that talent here, it's very interesting because fundamentally their risk takers still. Right? So they will go to startups over time. They might come with a bigger company, but over time they go into startups. So I think it's great for this market. You know, because you will see more and more people uh, you know, come out from that and go start new companies or join startup companies. So that's been very positive. Uh, is there something to do with some of the slides that you showed? Uh, I'm a research scientist at UD Austin, uh -huh. and we have developed some uh, <coughs> technology which UD is now uh, applying for a patent. Mm -hmm. And uh, we want to bring out this technology in a startup, but we are not sure what exact what the process might be. Some people are saying that you could put a business plan and try to license it. Yeah. Uh, what we need is something maybe of the order of about 300k, 400k at most right. to actually develop a prototype uh, while doing the day job that we are doing. Right. We don't have the capacity. People say build your own software, but it takes a lot of time to Absolutely. build it. And so, if somebody wanted 300 to 400 k, where would he go? That's the that that is where the local capital thing that I talked about is the biggest problem right now in this market. Because historically, that used to be Austin Ventures, Simon Rosen, Centerpoint. They would all do a seed deal uh, to help you kind of come out and build it to a level where they can then invest in the in the in the, in the company. But it's gotten harder and harder for them to do that. There's just no doubt about it. Um, today, I, I, and that's, by the way, one of the vacuums that we're hopeful to fill in when we raise our fund. You know, because what we're trying to raise is a smaller fund, a $100 million fund. And so for a $100 million fund, you can't invest more than 2 to $5 million bucks in a deal. So that's a sweet spot where you're talking about to be able to invest in that. Uh, but today, there's a couple of places you can like, think of that you can go. Uh, one is, as I told you, the Texas Emerging Technology Fund. You should definitely think about that because they have a very good, uh, that, that's their sweet spot too. And they usually tend to say, we'll give you a million or a million and a half, but it'll be tranched. We'll give you 300K, you do certain milestones, and then we'll give you another million, then you, you know, like that. So there are great examples of people who've done that. Uh, so I would, that's one, I would say that's a very important source. The other one is um, just angel investors in town. And there are some smaller funds that are that are doing those kinds of things. I mean, Silicon Partners is locally a good fund uh, that people know of. Uh, then there are S3 Ventures is there, Covera Ventures is there. There's a couple of smaller funds that are DFG Mercury. Uh, they're based in Houston, but they come here all the time. Uh, you can certainly talk to those guys. Those guys are uh, pretty good guys too. Uh, go after that. The main the struggle I've had when I've seen deals like that come out. Uh, and in fact, I've actually, I'm actually just talking to another candidate um, who's doing something similar in the wireless space. Is and don't take this the wrong way. I'm not. I don't intend to be offending you or anything. But they usually come out presenting itself as, "Here's the hammer. Which nail do I hit?" You know what I mean? Here's the technology. I've solved this problem. Now, who cares the most about the problem? And most investors go about it the other way around, which is, "Tell me you got a big problem." then you can tell me how you solve it, right? So one suggestion I might give you is try and find somebody, whether it's an, an entrepreneur in town or people that have worked at startups, to sit down with you to kind of nail the, the presentation 
on what the market is, what the, you know, just do a little bit of the work before you go to these guys. Because if you go in with just the, you know, like I, I had this guy who came in and said, we've built this new wireless algorithms um, that'll allow you to do multi-hop call handling. I'm like, okay, so why do I care about that, right? And then as he can explain it more and more, I was like, well, if I allow you to hop off from my phone to his because there's better cell coverage there, and you know that's just taking a call that would have been on the spectrum out. You can double your capacity without adding any more infrastructure. Now that's a big problem. People care about it, right? So it's that kind of stuff. So I would suggest before you go off and attack those guys, try and find a few, you know, somebody. And it could be a business school student you might know. Uh, some of the faculty at business school do a great job. The Texas Venture Labs is doing a lot of that stuff where they'll connect you with somebody. Um, you know, or you know, people. I mean, like people like Sini. I mean, these guys have been in startups before, right? So, just kind of find somebody who can help you make a presentation that is more around not just the technology, but also the the, the whole business. And then attack these guys. I think you'll have a better chance of getting better. Yeah, uh, yeah. I, I think what I hear is the first thing to do is take the technology to somebody who's been in the market and knows how uh, to talk to. Who just basically ha who can present a complete view of the of the idea, not just the problem you solve, but why it's important, how you can take it to market, that it's actually important enough that somebody will pay you money over time to build a company, that kind of stuff. Okay. Right. Okay. Right. Yeah, the UT Business School has a great class called New Venture Creation, run by Rob Adams of Texas Venture Labs, and it's a good class for you to sit in because it'll give you a pers perspective of what he's talking about. Yeah, basically. I've taken the same class by. When it was offered by Gary Karenhead, exactly. uh, and yes, uh, Rob Adams is uh, uh, what UD is saying is that uh, wait until the patent becomes a provisional, and then they will help. Uh, yeah, and they're, they're, it's changing, by the way. And I just met the new commercialization head of commercialization at UT, uh, and very accomplished person who knows the startup world. Comes from life sciences, so I don't know what whether your uh, well, uh, idea is in life sciences or not, but. Not, not, not exactly life sciences, more uh, sensors and... Uh, yeah, so I mean, but, but yeah, he understands startups and all yes. that stuff, and he's doing that too. I mean, I think there's obviously a certain amount of value for you to do that after your patent is out there, but the flip side is you don't have to wait to do all, I mean, developing a business case around why it's interesting doesn't depend on a patent, right? Uh -huh. I mean, and I always, personally, I'm, I'm very opinionated on this issue, but a lot of people come in and say, well, I can patent that, and I'm like, Patents are great for big companies. My personal opinion, they're very hard for small companies to be of any value realistically. Uh, defensively, at least. I mean, when you're selling your company, it's important that you have a patent, everything patented. But defensively, what are you gonna do if Microsoft infringes on your patent? You're gonna sue them? You'll sit in court for the next five years, spending all your equity money, you know, defending my, they, they have more money to send lawyers than you do, right? So it's not a defensive, tool in my opinion. It's more a value, when, you, when you're selling your company, there's value from patents. But before that, I don't think it's a defensive tool. So my suggestion to you would be at least the other stuff around putting a plan together. And just, you know, I, I'm happy to spend some time with you at some point if you have, uh, want to, just kind of give you some ideas on that. But just run it through a couple of friendly people who can give you without, because with a lot of investors, you get one shot. You know, and, Guys, it's not because we all try to be mean and we don't want to beat anybody the second time. It's just because when I was at AB, I mean, last year, just to give you an example, we're fundraising right now. We haven't been meeting entrepreneurs to invest at all. And we saw 110 deals last year. Just last year. And this is with us spending 95% of our time fundraising. Now I imagine uh, when I was at AB, I had six portfolio companies. I have six board meetings every month. I'm meeting all these same new deals. I have to be met, talking to my investors and managing those guys. There's just not enough time in the day for us to do all that, right? So that's why you get one shot. It's not because they're trying to shut you off. So use all these other sources to kind of get over the potential rookie mistakes, right? I mean, if there's anything that's just obviously wrong, people that have pitched to VCs can tell you that. People, if you know in the VC community, can take the time and help guide you. I'm happy to take the time if you want to at some point. Uh, but do that, and I think that really helps. Okay. I actually worked at a company that came out of Stanford, another like good group of researchers and one professor, and so on and so forth. They actually built you know what they thought was a cool technology, 
But then, you know, they were always like, you know, we want to build a, you know, file a patent and so on and so forth. But there was no aspect of, you know, what's the commercialization aspect or, you know, why would anybody care for this technology? So we actually spent a lot of time. And actually, we know Kosla invested in the company because of that Stanford thing. But even in the space that we were in, even we know Kosla didn't also didn't understand, you know, who actually cared about this problem or who has this problem or why should we care? So we actually had to spend about you know, close to a year figuring out, not even looking at the technology, you know, trying to go discover for all the different problems that people had, and then you know we brought technology into into that whole thing. So you know, it's it's the same same story. So and again, good good ideas actually come from uh, the universities and so on and so forth. But then it has to be married with the right you know business human to actually turn into a, a big business. And that is where Apple and Microsoft are different from. Sun, because if you look at Sun, the number of innovations that they came out with, uh, not just with Java, the whole server, uh, but it never was marketed to the extent like Apple or Microsoft did, which is market the solutions in a such a way that it meets the need of people, what they need, rather than a cool new toy, somebody has to figure out how to use, what to use it for. Everything has to come together too, right? I mean, you remember that. Apple's gotten all the tablet mania now, but how many of you had the old Apple, I forget the name of that, Newton. Newton. I had one. Yeah. That was only 15 years before its time, right? But, uh, you know, and then you had to learn how to write that particular it's Android. Palm OS was like that, so, the yeah, tablet PC was So there's like a lot of things that have to come together. Yeah. See, so that's, the, that's the other thing is just if you think about entrepreneurship and venture-backed companies and all that, um, then that's why the Bernanke quote to me is yeah. so interesting understand that not everything is in your control. It was the same Steve Jobs that did Apple Newton 15 years ago. Disastrous failure. But today, his iPad technology has taken over. Well, what's changed? A lot of things have changed around, right? It's not just the product, but capabilities have improved, wireless connectivity has come in. So sometimes it's not just the idea that you do, but how it fits into a broader ecosystem. It becomes more important. Well, what in your opinion uh, right, you, you, you'll be meeting a lot of entrepreneurs and uh, you'd go thinking they should have, would have, could have done this and probably that could have been a good thing before they come here. Like, any pointers on those that would help? Well, I mean, I think the big pieces of it is, it ties back to a little bit to what I was talking about uh, on, on this, on this slide, right? I mean, indirectly, these are the kinds of things you look for. Right. First and foremost, it's the team for us. And I'll tell you, you know, I would rather take a 60% uh, team with a 40% idea than a 60% idea with a 40% team. Bad teams will screw up good ideas. No question asked. Good teams will figure out how to convert something into a good idea over time. How do we evaluate the team? Do you interview each and, and everyone you do? And it's your, you know what, you know, you, great question. If I had the magic potion, I'd be selling it. <laughs> I don't. And have I made mistakes in teams? Absolutely. Because there is all. Yeah. How do you know how well yeah. somebody gels with somebody? See, in the uh, area, what not. I've seen is the VCs look at whether these guys have worked uh, together in the, the past. past. <laughs> if that they is. have, uh, that's the most important one. If they have studied together, they would have uh, taken the shocks of uh, relationship building. So that's one thing. And if they have worked in some companies together, mm -hmm. they would have crossed those politics and all that. They work together and they have come up with something. And these guys are coming together again to do something outside the company. So that's one of the criteria they look at. And okay, that helps. Yeah. There's no doubt about it. Yeah. We look for that too. I mean, if you find somebody who knows each other, as I said, the odds that you two people who meet at a first event, you know, come together, put a pitch, I can guarantee you I've seen that movie. 90% <laughs> of the time, it's it's not a good ending, right? So, so I think in that sense, you can't really tell, but, um, but having said that, you know, I, I don't know how many people here had arranged marriages. I did, right? How did you know your wife was the right person for you when you met her? That you either hit it off or you don't. And I can tell in a first meeting, a lot of times, you know, broad buckets, whether this is a team I want to spend the next five years of my life. Because don't forget that when we write a check as a venture capital firm, we spend the next six years with you guys of our life just as much as you do. 
right? So a lot of times you can tell, but where, where more tactically where it matters is experience together matters. Um, I'll tell you the other thing that matters a lot of times is I call it intellectual honesty. When somebody comes to me and presents to me, IDC told me it's a $4 billion market, and so-and-so told me it's a $100 billion market, and Google told me blah, blah, blah. And when you ask them, who's your competitor, and they can't think of one, I run to the door. Because that's bullshit. There is no $4 billion existing market that there is no competition in. Period. End of question. You might be creating a $4 billion market. And tell me that, I understand that. But don't tell me it's there today and hide behind IDC and whoever. <laughs> and then tell me I can't find any competitors. Because then either you're not looking, right? Or you have no idea what what you're going to do in the market. So small things like that matter. When we push back, what is their responsiveness? Some people come back, and I push back on purpose in some presentations, but I'll just emphatically say, that's complete bullshit. I'll just say it just to see the effect. A lot of people react differently when they get pushed back and put on the spot. Some people respond to it saying, interesting, why do you think it's bullshit? And they, there's a constructive challenge to the discussion. Some people get incredibly defensive about it, right? Well, in the next five years, if I give money to that company, I don't want to be thinking about, I know something's wrong in this company, but how am I going to go broach this subject to the guy? I need to be able to tell him, that's bullshit. It's not working. Let's figure out how to make it work, right? So there are, those are, you know, other small things that you can, you can see. Um, it comes back to, you know, the willingness to change that I talked about. Now, I mean, if the guy says, this is it. I mean, like, I'll give you a great example. Spatial Wireless was a company that, the first deal I did in the business, these guys came in, and it was very simple insight. They had two charts. One was minutes of wireless communication, talk, talk time. And the other one was the revenue per minute of wireless communication to the service part. So then how much you were going to pay. One slide, one chart went this way, the other one went this way. And so their hypothesis was carriers are going to be in trouble today if they have to support minutes, this many minutes, and get this little revenue out of it. Their infrastructure can't grow, they can't invest. And, and so they said, that's our idea. But their first idea when they came in was these guys had worked in the CDMA network side before. And so they came in and said, we want to build the next generation switch for CDMA markets. Why? Because that's what we know, right? So, I mean, we liked the idea. I wasn't sure about the CDMA market because that's 15% of the market from an infrastructure side standpoint, and GSM's the other 85%. We gave them a seed money, they worked on the plan, we introduced them to other customers, we brought in a board member that knew the wireless industry. By the end of the thing, they said, guys, we should go after GSM first, because that's the big place. They were, I mean, even though they were, these guys were CDMA background guys, they were willing to go on the GSM side. So you look for those kinds of things. I mean, if they had stuck and said, nothing do it, I'm just gonna do CDMA because I know how to do it, <laughs> you know some, you can read into it that kind of stuff. I don't know if I answered your question, but it's not, there's no formula for anything. I, um, I've seen like talking to people that uh, <laughs> talking to people that there's a like a misconception at least in some of the software you know startups that I've seen that uh, <laughs> let's say if uh, you know a company goes to a VC they say like uh, you know they're not sure how much stake a VC is going to take in the company and so can you like put, shed some light on like how uh, like a VC stake is decided like in a company and uh, yeah, sure. I mean, I guess that's why they call us vulture capitalists, right? <laughs> um, look, for every entrepreneur that's going to tell you that, just ask them who put a gun to his head and said you have to take that VC's money. Last I checked, it's a free country. You don't like my terms, go somewhere else, right? So, you know, it's a free market. It, that's so the answer to your question, in some ways, it's kind of, um, I mean, this is another great question a lot of people ask us, how do you do valuation on a Series A company? I mean, how do you value somebody, I mean, he comes to me with this great idea on sensor networks. How much is it worth today? Who can put a number on that and say that's a real number, right? So it's not driven by those kinds of things. Typically, the parameters that drive it, which indirectly give you a way of thinking about it, is first thing that drives it is capital. How much capital does he need? So 
So if he's coming in with a, um, I'm going to build an iPad app and it's going to cost me 300,000 bucks or max 500,000 bucks, and that's it, right? It's highly unlikely he will give up half his company for that. Highly unlikely. You know, somebody might be predatory and might do that. Now, he comes to me and says, I got a next generation semiconductor chip and it's going to take me 20 million bucks to build it. He's going to give me more than that because it's a lot more capital, right? So if I'm putting a lot more at risk, people want more ownership that if it works, I want to get paid for it. So that's one big piece that plays into the, into the formula. The second big thing that plays into the formula is, I mean, if you again think about what's the ownership structure after the first round of financing, there are three pieces of ownership to it. One is investor, who paid you money, how much did he get? Two is founder, had the idea, what option, what share of the company does he own? Three is option pool, management team. How much of the management team is coming in as the part of the founder team? Sometimes you have one founder, great idea, but I have to build an entire management team around it. That takes a lot of options to build that, right? Because people aren't gonna just show up to work with the founder owning 50% and they all collectively owning 2% of the company. They'll wanna be able to see the upside too. But sometimes we have four founders who are pretty much the full team. We might have to add only one or two more people on top from a management team standpoint. Then the option pool goes down a little bit. So those are the three buckets. And it's driven typically by how much team building is left. It's driven by how much capital is left. And I won't deny it. It's a little bit driven by how much competition is there for the deal. If there are three VCs that are fighting for the deal, the odds are you'll get better terms. But if there's nobody coming to look at your deal and I'm the only one, I'm gonna do it on my terms. And so it's a little bit of market kind of dynamics based on that. So again, no perfect answer for that, but I'm just trying to give you a sense for what place in that, in that okay. part of so Can you talk a little bit about preferred shares versus how many yeah. shares and how, whether the founder, has, do they get preferred shares or no. is it only VCs? It's typically the investors that get preferred shares. Um, so, how many people know what is preferred shares at all? Is that helpful to kind of explain what it is? So, so typically, so again, take this example. He comes to me, he says, I've got this sensor idea. I need a million bucks to start it. And I say, okay, fine, I'll give you a million bucks. I need to own 30% of the company, let's just say, right? Or 50%, make math easy. I need to own 50% of the company. So if I gave him a million dollars and I own, I get, I, I own 50% of the company, what's the value of the overall company? Two million dollars, right? Because fifty percent is a million dollars, so hundred percent is two million dollars. So the company is worth two million dollars. And let's say I did nothing, no preferred shares. Everybody's he's got the same shares I've got. Tomorrow he prototypes it enough. Somebody comes to him and says, "Hey, I'll buy this company for a million and a half bucks." What's his reaction? I get seven hundred and fifty thousand bucks. I'm out of here. <laughs> what happens to the investor? I put in a million bucks, and I get 750,000 bucks. I'm going to take it in my pants, right? So part of the reason we do preferred shares is we want to have some say in those kinds of situations. So the things that preferred shares do, in addition to common shares, is they give an investor a few additional rights. A very common right is what is known as liquidation preference, which means when you sell the company, I get certain amount of money out first before common shares can get anything. So in this case, what would have happened is, if I had preferred shares, I would have said, my money comes out first before you can get anything out of it. So if he sold it for a million and a half, I would have gotten my million dollars out first. And then in the other half, we would have split it 50-50. So it's not the same level of attraction for him to sell the company at a low price, right? So that's one thing that's called liquidation preferences. Then there are some other things that you can do yeah, and it gets fancy, but there, there are some other things that you do like uh, voting rights. For example, uh, being owners of preferred shares gives me rights to appoint members to, a direct, uh, to the board of directors. Uh, yeah, I might give myself a right to say that you have to have at least 60% uh, of the investors have to agree to selling the company before you can sell the company. So those are kinds of, you know, they're typically not economic terms. They're typically control terms that are attached to a common series to make them preferred shares. And so the investors are the only ones that own preferred shares. Um, now that changes when your company goes public. Because when you go public, although not in places like Google where the founders actually own the more important shares in Google after they went public, 
But typically what happens is when we are a private company, we have preferred shares. When they are going public, we have to convert to common shares before everything goes public. What happens when the founders themselves are putting some seed money? They get preferred shares for that. Oh, Anybody so that writes a check, for the check you get your preferred shares. For the check you get your preferred shares. It's only the people who are sweat equity, whether it's management team or founders, those tend to be in common shares. And it gets complicated. People try to engineer all kinds of things in that, but at the end of the day, that's what it is. It's really not that complicated. I have a question. Uh, uh, what happens to a person who is just uh, at innovation level but nothing to do about business aspects? No? But to take that innovation to real market, you need somebody who takes care of that. How the alliance between these two happen? It's a good question. Um, I mean, it, it, it really depends on whether you know the person that you brought on board. So like, I mean, you look at some, I mean, you look at Google, right? The Larry Page, Sergey Brin founders brought in Eric Schmidt as a CEO and, uh, you know, worked beautifully, went public, became big. Uh, and then there are cases where that was absolute disaster. I mean, Apple. Steve Jobs and uh, what was the name of the Pepsi guy? Was uh, no, the, the, the Pepsi Cola guy, CEO of Pepsi, that was brought in to run Apple before, but that's when Steve Jobs quit the first time. I mean, they just never saw eye to eye, right? So the Apple with Dell, right? I mean, they could see eye to eye, but well, with Dell, the difference was he brought in professional management himself, yeah. whereas Apple the board forced it on the ground. You know, so that's I, that's kind of what I'm saying is if you know. You know, hey, I'm a technologist, but I know these people who are business guys. No, suppose hey, I don't know anybody. Yeah. Like, what do you only about venture capitalists? Yeah. I have this idea. You should take care of everything else except technology part. I'll do it. Right. Is there a yeah, that problem? that's not uncommon yeah, at all. That's not uncommon at all. And uh, that's what. And when I was talking about why you need local local capital to venture capital to invest, that's the example of something. If you go from here to Silicon Valley and tell somebody. I'm a technologist, now you have to help me build out my team and bring everything here, and you're based in Texas, it's very hard for them to do that. Whereas if you're local, we know a lot of people, a lot of times they come out of our network where we go plug them into different companies. I mean, Sweeney is a great example, right? I mean, Ronnie Mark from the Valley, when I decided to move on and we were not going to do our startup, it was natural for him to plug into one more of the companies that we were involved in, that's how he plugged into this. So we tend to do that a lot. So that's not uncommon. Uh, and then it really becomes a question of, you know, what stake do you get? As I said earlier, if you're one person and i got to build the entire team, you probably will get a slightly lower ownership so that we can keep more in the option pool to be able to recruit the other people. But if not, you know, that tends to adjust. So maybe you also want to talk a little bit about live work and, you know, what's, what's your mission and where you are and well, I mean, so Live Oak Venture Partners is the name of our new fund. Uh, we're, we're in the market right now. Uh, fortunately, that means I can't say too much because there's all kinds of SEC regulations about that. But we're trying to raise a smaller fund uh, based here in Texas. <coughs> our strategy is to invest in early stage technology companies, uh, predominantly in Texas. Uh, again, it's like if I told somebody that I could go find the next Google in California before Sequoia or Kleiner finds it, they'll laugh me out of the room, right? How, will I, how am I going to find those guys there before these guys do? Similarly, what we take pride in is that we have the network here. We can find the entrepreneurs here better than anybody else can. And it's worked that way. For the last 10 years, Then we, even if somebody goes to a Sequoia or somebody on the West Coast or East Coast, we typically get a call from them right away saying, have you seen this deal? And if you did, do you like it? If you do, will you work with us on it? And we tend to partner with them to go do the deals. Um, so that's our strategy, early stage technology investing. Uh, we're IT guys, I'm not a health sciences guy. Um, so, but we like, uh, in addition to kind of traditional IT, we like to do information technology, uh, what I like, what I call the cross-section areas. IT intersecting with, uh, with life sciences is a very interesting field. Uh, there's a lot of kind of new diagnostic technologies, point of care technologies that uh, people with IT experience are getting into. We like those. Uh, a lot of clean tech um, stuff that we like. And again, in clean tech and all, I tend to be more 
oriented at extensions of IT rather than pure clean tech stuff. So, I mean, the next general solution to convert wood into gas, it's kind of a little hard for me to understand that. I mean, it's great areas. I mean, you know, I just don't know how to do it. Uh, what I tend to focus on a little more is the uh, things like, you know, efficiency measurement, energy efficiency management, those kinds of things, which are more, I mean, sensor based plays, that kind of stuff tend to be more coming out of the, the IT side. So that's what we're doing, the three partners, uh, myself, uh, Krishna Srinivasan, who is the second partner. Krishna used to work with me at Austin Ventures. Uh, unfortunately, he went to IIT. Uh, so you, I think our average kind of comes out okay, I guess. <laughs> He's an IIT guy, I'm an Osmania guy, so we come out in the middle. Um, but he, he's very similar background to me, UT Austin grad, Wharton MBA, um, and he's, he and I have worked together for 10 years. Uh, so that's the second partner. And then there's a third partner who's a much more experienced operating guy uh, called Ben Scott. Uh, ben used to be in the wireless industry. He used to be the CEO of Verizon Wireless before, uh, ran IXC Communications here, uh, ran PCS Prime Co here. Uh, and so he's going to be our third partner. And so the three partners, that's what we're trying to do. Hopefully, we'll, we're in the middle of fundraising right now, so hopefully, hopefully we'll be ready to invest the uh, second half of this year. All sense. In your tenure as a VC, uh, have you found, uh, was there any instance someone approached you and you felt this is not going to work and turned him away and that turned out the way it's successful? <laughs> Actually, you know, uh, it's a great question. Uh, go to, uh, when you have a, a movement, go to Bessemer Ventures website. Uh, there's a guy there called Felda Hardiman. Uh, he teaches at Harvard Business School now. Capital and Power Business School, but uh, he's got a great thing there. He calls it his bloopers page. Uh, because every VC puts on all the deals that they did really well, right? Uh, but he actually lists all the deals that he saw, and, and it's really funny because you go see, like, you know, like uh, he saw Apple, he saw Lotus, and he turned them down, and he turned on Google saying, Who the hell is going to pay this much money for that? It's really funny stuff. Um, and fortunately, I don't have that big names uh, for it. But yeah, no, there are definitely deals that we've seen that we could have, uh, I mean, a great example very early in my career was a company here called Sigmatel, uh, which was there for a long time. It was there for 96 onward, way before I got into the venture business. But I mean, I saw it was a company that had changed three lives, right? I mean, went from being a broadband company to a DSL company to a, I mean, that ended up becoming an MP3 chipset company. And we saw every incarnation of that company uh, at AV. And so we all went in and looked at it, and we said, yeah, this is never going to work. Who wants to buy these little devices that you're going to listen to music to? Um, next thing you know, it was that was the year of the MP3 device, Christmas season. And it went from nothing to $100 million of revenue and $800 million of market cap in one year. Of course, it went back up four years after that. But uh, So yeah, there are, there are cases like that. I mean, we, guys, I mean, all the things I told you about intellectual honesty apply as much to us as it does to you. And in fact, the thing that's worse is when the VCs who have the money don't have the intellectual honesty. You know, it's a very high ego, high testosterone business because success 